Welcome once again to Examples Tutorial. Mostly all of us have experienced cuts or bruises followed by oozing of a red fluid called blood. Today our topic of discussion is blood. In this video we will learn about its composition, formation and their main functions. Blood is a fluid connective tissue which helps to transport nutrients, hormones and respiratory gases to different parts of the body and removes unwanted substances. So does it mean that blood carries all the good and unwanted substances mixed together? The answer is certainly no. In fact, blood follows a very clever path to keep essential substances separated from unwanted substances. Let us have an idea how does it happen. Gaseous exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide takes place inside the lungs. After the exchange, oxygen containing blood from lungs enters the left auricle of heart via pulmonary vein. Then it goes to the left ventricle and as the ventricle contracts, blood leaves the heart via aorta and travels to different parts of the body. Capillaries present at different points in the body helps in gaseous exchange, that is the cell take up oxygen and gives out carbon dioxide. Now at this point, Veins take their action and carry the oxygenated blood back to heart. Blood enters right auricle via inferior and superior vena cover and then travels to right ventricle. As the ventricle contracts again, blood goes out of heart and enters lungs via pulmonary artery. Here the entire process of gaseous exchange repeats and circulation continues. More detail about this we will learn in circulatory system chapter. Now often we get confused with arteries and veins. An easy way to keep it in mind is that artery starts with the letter A and away also starts with the letter A. So artery except pulmonary artery carry oxygenated blood away from heart to deliver it to other parts of body and vein except pulmonary vein carry the oxygenated blood and deliver it to heart. Now let us see besides oxygen and carbon dioxide. What are the other substances carried by blood? If we take a sample of blood and then centrifuge it in a centrifugal machine that is rotated it at a high speed, then three separate layers of substances are obtained. The topmost clear solution which occupies about 55% of total volume of blood is called plasma. The thick dense bottom red layer is called RBC or erythrocytes. This occupies about 45% of total volume and the volume percent of red blood cell is also known as hematocrit value. Normal value is 45% for men and 40% for women. Less than this value gives us an indication of anemia. In between these two layers, a very thin buffer layer is present which are platelets and leukocytes. This occupies less than 1% of total volume of blood. The fluidity of blood is due to the presence of plasma. Now let us see what are the components present here. Note here 90% of plasma is actually water and some important proteins occupies only 8% of it. And these are albumin which maintains osmotic pressure, globulin further give rise to antibody that is very much helpful to develop our immune system. And another important protein is fibrinogen which helps in clotting of blood. Here I haven't mentioned the name hemoglobin, so don't consider hemoglobin or globin as a plasma protein. Plasma also contains hormones, electrolytes, nutrients like glucose, amino acid, cholesterol, etc. Even unwanted waste products like creatinine, urea, bilirubin and gases like carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide are transported through plasma. Sodium, potassium, magnesium are some of the important ions present here and all these occupy only 2% of the total volume. Next we will see the thick dense bottom layer called erythrocyte or RBC. Red blood cells are most abundant cells found in blood. About 5 million per microliter of blood. Oh this is a big number. These are unnucleated by concave dumbbell shaped cells. And RBC contains a most important protein called hemoglobin, which is responsible to carry oxygen by forming oxyhemoglobin. And normal value of hemoglobin in blood is 12 to 16 gram 
per 100 ml and if the value goes down then the condition developed we all know it's called anemia. RBC are very short lived cells and average lifespan is 120 days and the old and defective RBCs undergo eryptosis or programmed death with the help of macrophages and subsequent phagocytosis in spleen, liver and lymph nodes. Next is a buffer layer which occupies a very small place, less than 1% of the total volume of blood. And these cells are white blood cells or leukocytes. These are approximately 4000 to 11000 cells per microliter of blood, which is much lesser than RBC. These cells are mainly involved in developing immunity. Cells are mostly colorless and thus the nucleus takes up the colors of the stain in which they are studied. Depending on the type of nucleus, WBCs are broadly divided into granulocytes, having granulocytoplasm with lobed nucleus and agranulocytes without granulocytoplasm. Granulocytes are further divided into basophils having large lobed granular nucleus. When an infection occurs, mature basophils will be released from the bone marrow and travel to the site of infection. When basophils are injured, they will release a substance called histamine which contributes to the inflammatory response that helps to fight against invading organism. The second type of granulocyte is eosinophil which appears red in eosin stain and the nucleus is bilobed. Eosinophils respond to chemicals emitted by parasites and induces an allergic response. The third granulocyte is neutrophil and they appear blue in hematoxylin. They are known to kill pathogens like bacteria and fungi by producing some substances as they phagocyte the entire organism. The other type of white blood cell is our granulocytes having large nucleus. They are further subdivided into lymphocytes and monocytes. Lymphocytes have a very large nucleus and are made to form antibodies. They develop immune system. And the second agranulocyte is monocyte and they possess a phagocytic mode of action when immune system is threatened by any foreign pathogen. Apart from these, the buffer layer also contain another very important component called platelets. They do not have any cell nucleus and they are derived from megakaryocytes of the bone marrow. The main functions of platelet is hemostasis, that is the process of blood coagulation at the site of injured blood vessels. And disorder of platelet adhesion give rise to the syndrome or the disease called bernard sulier syndrome. Next we will see where does the blood cell form. Blood flowing inside a blood vessel is not synthesized in the same place. Instead, they are formed from pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells. That is, they can give rise to any type of blood cell and this originate from bone marrow present inside a bone. If we cut a cross section of bone, then we will see a cavity surrounded by collagen fiber and the cavity is formed of bone marrow. This gives rise to hematopoietic stem cells. The stem cells are further developed into two different lineages and they are myeloid lineage and lymphoid lineage. The following diagram will give you an illustration of the different types of blood cells originating from common pluripotent stem cell. Myeloid progenitor cells give rise to RBC, platelets, eosinophil, basophil, neutrophil and macrophages. And there is also mast cell which are responsible for allergic reaction. And lymphoid progenitor stem cell give rise to lymphocytes and natural killer cells. Note here white blood cells are thus formed from both lymphoid and myeloid progenitor cells. Before I end this video, let us summarize the different functions performed by blood. Blood helps in transportation of different essential substances and helps in removing unwanted substances as well. It maintains body temperature, develops immunity to fight against diseases and last but not the least, it helps in clotting of blood. Hope you have liked this video and for more details do visit our website examples.com. See you again with some new topic. Till then happy learning.